We're dealing with the Western branch of the Indo-European family of languages, the Teutonic or the Germanic group, and it's West Division and Low German subdivision. We're talking about the Saxons and the Jutes and the Angles. And the Jutes are kind of left out as far as the naming of the people and um, the naming of the language is concerned. We take the Angles for Anglo and the Saxons for Saxon, we end up with Anglo-Saxon. Now, Old Saxon was the first of the uh, Saxony tongues, and it was Old Low German. Um, this was back on the continent. But whenever they came to Britain, the Saxons, later followed by the Angles, uh, then their language became Anglo-Saxon or Old English. And it's this language, in this language, that the earliest, um, first of all, paraphrases, metrical paraphrases, of uh, people like Kedman and some of his contemporaries, and then after that, shortly thereafter, what we could really call translations. Kedman is not so much of a translation as you saw from Kedman's hymn last week, actually are brought forth in the Old English or the Anglo-Saxon tongue. The Anglo-Saxon or the Old English tongue is as different from Middle English, particularly Modern English, as daylight is from darkness. And I promise you that this week we would take a look at um, Anglo-Saxon. Uh, you've heard the term before. All of us have heard the term. We're familiar with that term, and we've heard of the Anglo-Saxon people and the Anglo-Saxon language. And we're called Anglo-Saxons, you see. We're Anglo-Saxons in this country. And if you've ever wondered what your language used to look like, uh, then here's a good representation of it. Anglo-Saxon or Old English. Well, I didn't think I would get a whole lot on there. I had a whole long, well, I guess a whole paragraph, a rather long paragraph. So here we go. Me bilf get thy fortran, thea the faran, brought swea de wingendra, said hergas, irla unrim. All right, you with me? You got all that interpreted now? <laughs> That's English. That's your language right there. Helm, elm, while mitig. Ditrin thur mine han to dagi thism and so forth. <laughs> Look at this, uh, where is it? Look at this big term right here. Looks like Swedenborganism is what it looked like. Whenever I first saw it. Here's some more. And I had a lot more. It just won't all fit on there. I guess I could have written it all up here, but I think you get the point from that. Me willeth ill Andre than dead Fetham Foggy First Locon. <laughs> you know that's got to be an important sentence. First Locon. First Locon. Here we are. First Locon. And it even has an exclamation point there. Feistes on in the Linus Life's El Islar Goddess Ab Braden Ab Brostom. Yeah, it sounds like German. And what is it? German. German. Remember, all this comes from German. It should sound like that. That's being perceptive. Now let's let's translate here. And now I I don't have the ability to translate, so I'm gonna I'm gonna believe someone else's translation here because I don't know Old English. You can see, it's like studying a foreign language almost to be able to learn this and you know what the words mean. I mean, what words do you even recognize on there? Him. <laughs> him right here. No, that doesn't mean him. <laughs> my, thy, mine hand. Mm, ah, my hand. That's good. Some of it's going to mean the same. <laughs> About. First Locon. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I like that one. As soon as I saw that, I like First Locon. That's what you say when you hit your finger with a hammer. First Locon. First Locon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, this is this is one of those metrical paraphrases. It happens to come from Moses' words in Exodus chapter 14, uh, verse 13 and following. Probably done by one of the English poets influenced by Kedman. 
Now, some people actually attribute this to Kedman. But, uh, and we know that he did other works. Remember that he went beyond just Kedman's hymn, The Story of Creation. He sang of the Exodus. He sang of their entrance into the Promised Land. He sang of our Lord's incarnation, his passion, his resurrection, ascension. He sang of the coming of the Holy Spirit. He sang of the teaching of the apostles. We know that he did a lot in the Old Testament as well as in the New. But uh, I don't think it can be proven that this should correctly be ascribed to him. But obviously, um, it's Old English. It's a metrical paraphrase. It is part of the scriptures, which happens to be the story of the Exodus in Exodus 14, verse 13 and following, put to music with, uh, with elaborate alliteration that's put to music. Again, you're not going to be able to see it in this because this is just an English, our modern English copy of that. Although a lot of the letters were made the same, a lot of those have changed as well. But anyway, let's go on to, um, to a translation of <laughs> uh, the first sentence. Okay, we've got it broken up into sentences. Here's an exclamation point, so you can kind of follow where we're going. Be not frightened thereat, though Pharaoh has brought sword wielders, the Swedenborgianism, sword wielders, vast troops, uh, men without number. To them all will the mighty Lord Oh, here's mighty, I guess. Will? Where's, where's Lord? I don't know which word is Lord. Must be dritten or thur. Thur is close to Thor. Maybe that was God. To them all will the mighty Lord through my hand this very day a recompense give Then we got what? Uh, that they may not live long to frighten with distress Israel's kin. All right, you see how far? You're probably back up here, and here we are down here. Well, we can see Israel there. Israel's kin. C Y N. For kinfolk. Um, be not afraid of a dead army. And if you follow, you can probably follow a lot of this right in Exodus as well. Be not afraid of a dead army. Uh, dead army. I know what I know what this last one is. First of all, con, death doomed bodies. Death doomed bodies. Exclamation point. First of all, con. Uh, the term is at end of their mortal life. Period. By you, last sentence here that's, that's up here anyway, by you the exhortation of God has been removed from your breasts. By you the exhortation of God has been removed from your breasts. Just the way that they would have written it. And then it goes on after that. Um, Ik on veteran rod that ge girth within Voldris Aldor and El Lifrain Lissa Bid Sigora Gesento Thergit Sethian. Uh, this is Se Ekia Abrahamus God. Um, Frums Kefra Fre Sephas Fide Wirth Modig Maginfroth Midtha Miklon Hand. And all that means I offer better counsel that you honor the Prince of Glory and pray the Lord of Life for favor to you, victories, fruit, wherever you journey. It is the eternal God of Abraham, creation's Lord, who this camp protects, valiant and powerful with that mighty hand. Very beautiful poetry and obviously very scriptural. But I don't know, and we trace our English translations back to Kedman and back to his contemporaries or people that lived shortly thereafter, such as the anonymous author of this, who might have been influenced by him. But I don't know that we actually refer to things like this as English translations of the scripture, though, because it's hardly a translation. If you look in Exodus chapter 14, verse 13 and following, and just kind of read along there, this is the jest, I'm sure, of what's being said. I'm not, I didn't look up the passage myself. I don't even know if Abraham is mentioned over there. But that's certainly the gist of the passage, that uh, something about Pharaoh, something about God subduing Pharaoh, and something about don't anyone here in the camp of Israel be afraid uh, because God and his mighty hand are encompassing our camp and he and his forces are protecting us. 
surely you haven't, um, I mean, we would certainly call this an extremely paraphrastic or an extremely free translation. Um, this would even be worse than the expanded Bible or the living Bible, you know, as far as expanding what was really said there. But I don't think that they could be properly accused of heresy or anything like that by these interesting things that they've written. Like I say, I don't think Kedman is the author of this, but surely he wrote things very similar to this. And if he's not, then it's just someone else's influence who came under his influence, another English poet who came under his influence uh, produced this, this early magnificent work. Now we have a lot of examples like this. This is one of, um, I guess, the more outstanding ones and one of the better known ones. That's how I was able to uncover it and come across this. But we do have a lot of examples of not Kedman's work so much, but works done by others during that period of time that are very similar to this. So what I'm just trying to introduce you to right now, and just let this point remain with you, um, that the beginning of English translations, what you have with you this morning, an RSV, a KJV, an NIV, a NASV, an ASV, a JB, what you have with you this morning um, owes its, its origin to this type of material right here so that at least you are familiar intellectually with the, the beginnings and the foundations that were laid for current English translations. If someone has anything to say about English translations and, you know, when did they begin? Then you can go back to around the end of the 7th century, 680, remember, in the time of Kedman. And remember the little story about the man who stole away to sleep in the stable. He was embarrassed to sing with the other monks because he had poor quality of voice. And a voice came to him in his vision and said, sing, and he said, yeah, and but what must I sing? Sing of things first created. And he gave us Kedman's hymn. So it's interesting to know that. So you know something yourself about the origin of English translations. Otherwise, I think it's um, because we think England to be a rather recent country and the language in England to be, to be a rather recent development. Um, it's almost easy to fall for some uh, lay persons teaching about this that English translation started somewhere around the King James Bible or people who don't even think that far back think they just started in this century or something and not think that wow we've had translations paraphrases anyway we'll get to our first actual translation here in a moment but paraphrases that go back hundreds and hundreds yes over a thousand years ago for the beginning of English work okay and Kedman is the most important uh, early representative. He's, he's the earliest one that we know. Um, that's why he's, he and his name are rather easy to stay with us. Okay, let's look at a couple of other things here under the same time as Kedman, shortly thereafter the time of Kedman, that were probably definitely influenced by him. Um, and you can kind of put them as A and B under number one. Number one is, is Kedman and kind of A and B under him. First of all is Kenny Wolf. Kennewolf was one influenced um, by, by Kedman, and we're going to see some other people. I'm not going to give you all the names, but uh, these are some that are, that are still uh, rather well known. Kennewolf. C-Y-N-E-W-U-L-F. I believe it's pronou uh, pronounced um, Kennewolf. He lived around 750. That's about 70 years after the time of Kedman. He was an English poet who lived in Northumbria. Remember where Kedman was from? I think he was up in that territory as well. Uh, Kennewolf, just like Kedman, later in life became a monk. And four poems are ascribed to him. They're ascribed to him because of what we call a runic, R-U-N-I-C, a certain type of writing, a certain handwriting, a style, uh, because of his runic signature in the epilogue of these four poems. This is just for your information. None of this I'm sure you'll remember. I may not remember all of this. I'm sure I'll remember some of it a few years from now, but just for your information. Four poems attributed to him. We know that he's the author by his runic signature that's signed in the epilogue. The first poem is entitled Elaine. E-L-E-N-E. -E -E. 
which is the story of how Helena, <coughs> Elaine is just another form of Helen or Helena, it's, it's two names are really the same. The story of how Helena, who, do you remember who Helena was? She was uh, the mother of Constantine. How Helena found the true cross. Helena was one of the first people to take a pilgrimage, you see, back to Jerusalem. And while other people were finding tooths and hairs from Peter's head and mouth, she was actually finding the true cross. Now, be sure you rib your child sitting next to you and kind of smile so they'll know that I'm not telling the truth. <laughs> That's just legend that she found the true cross. She found it. We'd be over there hijacking it, bringing it over here. Put it up on top of the... Make that our steeple on top of the building here. <laughs> Another that she wrote, Fate of the, or that he wrote, Fate of the Apostles. Now, so far, it doesn't look like much Bible translation going on here, just kind of poems, religious, biblically based poems. At least we got the cross in the first one. Fate of the Apostles, which is just that, legends. Many people have written legends of the later lives of um, the 11 apostles. We know about the later life of that 12th one, but... The eleven apostles, what did they do later on in life? <laughs> then a third poem, uh, Juliana. And a fourth poem called Christ. And probably only the last part on the ascension in Christ is actually by Kenny Wolf. It's divided up into different sections concerning the life of Christ. And probably only the last part that deals with the, with the ascension is by Kenny Wolf. Now, Christ, along with Juliana, expressed strong, strong Trinitarian doctrine. Remember last week we saw how Kedman uh, expresses a strong belief in the realities of the afterlife, heaven and hell. He speaks of the burnings and the horrors and the torments of hell. And I think I said back then, you see, it's not a modern invention, what our conception is. It's not something invented by the Southern Baptist Convention to scare people into the church or into the kingdom. That view of hell that it is a place of torment, of horrible torment, of unending torment, and heaven is just the opposite of that, uh, multiplied by a thousandfold. Well, here also, we're rather early in the church's history, and we see a strong Trinitarian um, emphasis, strong Trinitarian doctrine uh, being propounded in Juliana and Christ. In other words, they believed in God as, as a triune being, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Those four are rather certain to Kenneth Wolf. And then he may have done two others. One called the Dream of the Cross and one called the Last Judgment. He may have done those. If so, there's six. But at least we know we've got four specifically that um, he's done. Kenneth Wolf, as well as a whole lot of other people around this period of time, are evidently picking up the example set by Kedman and giving us comparable English paraphrases. And then letter B here under Kedman, we're going to skip all the way down to the 10th century, which is just 200 years later in the 900s. In the 10th century, there's a metrical paraphrase of the book of Judith, the apocryphal work of Judith. We only have part of what was a much longer and larger poem. And thankfully, that part we have is that gruesome, gory part of her slaying in very vivid and terms and fashion Holofernes. Remember how she sneaks into his tent and is able to lop his head off and put it in her lunch basket and tote it back to Israel with her. So thankfully, we have the most interesting part of that poem preserved for us. Very vivid slaying of Holofernes, that pagan general of the army that was leading his forces against Israel. And Judith was the heron of the story, much like Esther was in the biblical book, remember. But none of, none of these examples here under number one really give us um, a Bible translation. I said last week, here's our first English translation, just to emphasize the point. Here's the first work we have as far as the Bible being taken from its language into the language of the English people. But you know what a translation is. It's a translation. It's not telling stories about the cross or about the apostles or even about biblical stories, telling stories about those stories. You have to write the stories out as the stories were written. So remember that these earliest works are metrical paraphrases. Metrical paraphrases, they're not true translations of Scripture. 
For that, we have to come to number two in a man named Aldhelm, who gives us our actual first translation. who lived from 640 to 709. Now look, that's the same, that's the same time as Kedman. Kedman's dying around 680. This man would be 40 years old at the time then. Aldhelm, A-L-D-H-E-L-M. Now his name may not stick with you as well or as long as does that of Kedman, but Aldhelm gave us the first capital letters translation underlined of the Bible into Anglo-Saxon. However, it wasn't a translation of the whole Bible. He's the first one to give us a real translation, but not a translation of the whole Bible. And we generally find it going something like this. We have way back here in the beginning, just paraphrases. And then we'll have someone um, give us a translation that's just really partial. It may even be of a whole book. It may actually include a whole book, but that still leaves us with 65 other books that have not been translated. And then someone gives us, you know, a translation of one of the Testaments, like the Old or the New Testament. Probably the New Testament. If Christians are the ones doing the work. And then we work our way on down. You see how it builds up. No one just sits down and the very first person who's ever thought of it and says to himself, well, I think what I'll do is, is translate the 66 books of the Bible. That's a rather monumental task to approach with you know um, a lot that needs to be done behind that. And so you start off somewhere and tell stories, write in metrical paraphrase, some early stories from somewhere in Scripture, and then give us a few, maybe the 23rd Psalm, uh, maybe the 22nd Psalm. Maybe the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. Um, maybe the last chapter of Revelation. Some, or maybe the first chapter of the Gospel of John. And then someone gives us a book. You know, that's an important book worth knowing. They not, they're not going to do First Chronicles, the first book that they do. They're going to do a book that's more important for spiritual purpose for, for the people to know. And then maybe a whole testament and then maybe the whole Bible. So what does he give us? He gives us earliest translation of the Bible, translation into Anglo-Saxon, Old English, of the Psalter, sometime shortly after the beginning of the 8th century, 20 plus years after Kedman's hymn, 20 plus years after Kedman's hymn. Okay, so what's Kedman known for? Giving us our first work in Anglo-Saxon of the Bible. Anything about the Bible, the first one that we can document is Kedman. Mr. James Kedman. We don't know his first name. Kedman. First translation, Aldhelm. First translation. What we know about him comes from 12th century sources. What we knew about Kedman came from the century after him. What we know about Aldhelm comes from 12th century sources. We know that he founded the monastery at Malmesbury. And we've discussed Malmesbury before. Don't worry if you don't remember it. He founded the monastery at Malmesbury. Was the first bishop of, it seems like we got some places like this, some names like this around here. Sherburn. By the way, you ought to be noticing as you people are traveling around here and you see signs and towns, think about it. Are these English names here? First Bishop of Sherbin, which was in the little town of... in South England. Dorset. Or as we Southerners would say, Dorset. But they generally preferred saying it so you don't have to take all day to say it. So just endorse it. Look at those names there. Those Malmesbury. We don't see too many Malmesbury's around here, but it seems like we pass a Sherman or Dorset every now and then. <laughs> you ought to just be noticing that. That teaches you something. Remember, we're living in New England, and especially around here in Vermont, you'll find English names. Well, you find them down in Massachusetts. You find them all over New England. English names everywhere. <laughs> and you go some other type of place, and you find German names. Uh, Germans didn't settle New England, though. Germans went to other parts of this country. 
Uh, you also find a lot of Indian names uh, around here. You get over in uh, um, New Hampshire, I guess, particularly, you find lots of Indian names, but uh, those are left over from, obviously, the Indians who lived around here, like the Kangamangus Highway. Um, that has to be an Indian name. He was, Ald Aldhelm, was perhaps the greatest pupil of Theodore of Tarsus. Theodore of Tarsus, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury from 668 to 690. Just remember, although you may not recall the statistics later on, you'd be surprised how you'll know that you've heard that name one day in the future, Theodore of Tarsus, Archbishop of Canterbury. Whether you can remember what's going on or what the period of history is, at least it'll be a name that you've heard somewhere in your life before. That's the way I learned all these things. And the more you hear them, all of a sudden it stays with you. Um, Canterbury is one of the um, famous abbeys over in England, which I'm sure we've all heard of that. Um, and by the way, if you noticed in National Geographic's magazine, the latest publication, they had a whole article in there on Westminster, Westminster Abbey and Big Ben and the whole history of the building of Westminster and its burning and its rebuilding. That goes way back into the Middle Ages. And National Geographic did a really excellent article and you know what National Geographic is known for, it's pictures, fantastic pictures in there of Westminster in England. Canterbury is on the same scale. A uh, couple of other things before we move on past Ald Aldhelm, difficult name to pronounce. The first organ used in England was built under his directions. These men were famous for doing other things, let me assure you of that, than just dabbling around with Bible translation work. Now, you generally will read that he built the first organ. I think it's a little more proper and a little more correct to say that the first organ used in England was built under his supervision. Whether his hand ever touched the thing, we don't know. But I guess it's all right to say he built it because sometimes that can mean that he didn't really build anything, but he supervised someone who did. Aldhelm had the habit of immersing himself up to his neck in a pool of water by the monastery, both summer, fall, winter, and spring. And he would not come out until he had recited the whole Psalter in Anglo-Saxon. Remember, he translated the Psalter. So I would imagine during the wintertime you got to being able to do it rather quickly, <laughs> very quickly. He would do it all seasons of the year, immerse himself in a pool of water beside the monastery until he finished reciting the entire Psalter every day. I don't know if I want to find fault with that, do you? It sounds kind of weird to me, but I'd love to know the book of Psalms by heart. I guess if that, I guess that's a way to do it. <laughs> you will learn it. <laughs> when you're in the water and it's, you know, anywhere below 40 degrees outside, you will learn the Psalter and you will recite it rapidly and quickly. It'll probably sound more like uh, Spanish instead of Old English by the time you're through <laughs> quoting the Psalter. Old Helm, interesting fellow. A lot of these people did things like that during this period of Christian history. That's nothing unusual at all. Uh, that happens, well that happens even today, but uh, I think that we've come become, quote, more civilized, end of quote, than people back there. What I mean by that is more humanistic, so we don't think it's important to go to great lengths to gain any type of spirituality or spiritual depth. I think they had what probably the apostles would uh, accuse them of, of false ways of going about trying to become spiritual. But for, for me, the end would justify the means there. If you, if you can get spiritual by immersing yourself in water in winter and quoting the book of Psalms, hop to it. And then the third person that we'll come to is, is Egbert. Egg Egbert. <laughs> Remember a pop singer here not that many years ago who took the name Engelbert Humperdinck? Engelbert, that's a good name from the old Anglo-Saxon royal line of kings. He and Humperdinck, I forget what his real name was, it certainly wasn't, no mother would have named his son that today. Engelbert <laughs> Humperdinck, better naming Butch or Rocky or Meathead or something than Engelbert Humperdinck, but he was an English singer though. Engelbert Humperdinck, 
Anyway, I thought of him when I saw Egbert. <laughs> uh, he died around 766. He was a pupil of Bede. Bede will be our next figure that we discuss. And we'll conclude with him. So I'm having to give you Bede's name ahead of time. He was a pupil of Bede. He was a cousin of Keelwolf, who was king of Northumbria. Not the same as Cinewolf now. That was Kinewolf. That was the other one. Keelwolf. Don't you remember the, the epic poem Beowulf during this time? You see, all these are English names. Keelwolf, who was king of Northumbria, king of the Anglo-Saxons in Northumbria. In 732, Egbert was appointed by the Pope as the second Archbishop of York. We have lots of Yorks around here including a new one. He was most famous for the founding of his theological school. He was most famous for founding a theological school. That uh, Alcun came from. A-L-C-I-U-N. A-L-C-I-U-N. He was his most famous pupil. He was a member of Charlemagne's court and gave us a revision of the Vulgate that we discussed with the Vulgate. Okay, Egbert Meathead here, he was the one who gave us our second translation. Our second translation of what? Of the Synoptic Gospels around 705. Alt him the first man who gave us an English translation of the Psalter somewhere just before 705. Egbert the second man to give us an English translation this time of the Synoptic Gospels around 705. And then the last figure we're going to discuss this morning that we'll have to discuss in a little more detail is Venerable Bede. The venerable, the very venerable Bede. This is not all. Now, we have more people still under this first period of 450 to 1100 from the Anglo-Saxon, more or less, invasion to the Norman invasion in the time of William the Conqueror. We have more translations to discuss, more men under this period of time, but we'll just, we'll stop with these. So we've done... Kedman is our, is our first important one, and Kenneth Wolf and others come under here. Kedman, Albert, Egbert, and Venerable B. 673 to 735. 673 to 735. Bede was one of the greatest of all scholars, and he was the father of English history. And I'll give you uh, more details of uh, the biographical background of him and of his life. He was committed to the monastic life by his parents in Northumbria at age seven, in the year 680. Uh, he was made a deacon at the monastery at the unusually young age of 19. And he had become a priest by age 30. He's the one who gives us all the information that we know and have about Kedman, remember. So uh, we are indebted to him for that. Uh, he was a monk all the rest of his life at Jero. Never traveled beyond Northumbria which would incline us to think that he must have been restricted in his knowledge, not being a well-traveled man. Hardly was that the case. It didn't hinder his massive learning abilities at all. Uh, he learned Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, which was unusual for that period of time. Uh, and he knew some of the classical writers and church fathers, knew their writings well. Some of those church fathers include Ambrose, Jerome, Augustine, and Gregory the Great. Yeah. 
it seems like what combined, what two things combined themselves in the person of Venerable Bede uh, to make him the scholar, the church historian that he was, um, the two things were, this: first of all, the simple faith of the Celtic church. It's the simple, daily, practical, uh, ethical faith of the Celtic church. He certainly had a lot of that in him. That joined with the intellectual learning brought from the continent, from the great universities on the continent, brought by Theodore of Tarsus, remember Archbishop of Canterbury, from 668 to 690. I think the simple Christian faith of the Celtic Church and the intellectual learning brought from the continent by Theodore of Tarsus united themselves in Bede to make him one of the greatest living scholars of his day. He had very thorough scholarship. I've already told you some of the languages that he learned. He was familiar with classical writings. He was familiar with some of the church fathers. Uh, he was very thorough in his scholarship in that he did, he did, before he ever wrote on a topic or commented on a subject in, in a public uh, fashion, in public preaching, he always, as exhaustively as possible for his resources, by that I mean his um, books and so forth, um, to which he had access, either in his own private library or there in the monastery, uh, he would, to as great an extent as possible, exhaustively research the topic make extensive notes on all aspects of it. Um, be sure that he gave credit to all authors and writers who came before him. When he would give a statement in his writing or something, he would give credit for who had given that before him. His source, in other words, his origin. He would, you know, in other words, he would always document all of his writings, footnote, and give um, um, due credit to those um, from whom he had gotten some of his material, which just goes to show how thorough his scholarship was. He would very diligently search out the truth of history through all the available records. And I think um, that's um, the, whole, the whole study of history by professional historians um, involves the very things in which Bede himself was involved, and too many historians read their own current history back into ancient history and end up with a very warped view of it. You have to go back to what we call primary sources. If you don't have any primary, you go back to secondary sources. But Bede would go back to primary as well as secondary sources to find out, you know, what the history of his people really was. And by the way, that's, that's the name of his important work, An Ecclesiastical History of the English Nation. His, his most famous work, not only his most famous work, but one of the most reliable of all ancient documents written just four years before he died in 731. Now, if he didn't have any good primary or secondary written sources, and he relied upon the best oral tradition, but he stated that as such, that we need to be um, very careful in our scholarship and our study that um, we follow the principles set forth by someone like B. Now, there are certain principles and certain practices that have to be followed by anyone who's going to study history, by anyone who professes even to be a lay historian. And it's just too easy and it's also too dangerous to read your own history back into other people's times or to read what you wish would have happened back then into that period that actually didn't happen. And uh, I don't really know why people do that uh, because it, it, doesn't, it doesn't prove anything. Either those are facts from ancient history or they're not. And you can lie about them and insert a whole lot of other things and that doesn't change the fact that facts are facts. And it doesn't change the fact that um, you're not going to be able to make the, the correct connections or um, ascertain why this certain nation fell or why this other man rose to power if you pervert and distort and discolor the facts of history. So just, it's a word to all of us. It's certainly a word to me um, in studying the life of someone like Bede. He was such a careful scholar to make sure that he read the facts of history to be true facts. And if you don't have good sources and you can't document all this, then he would base it on the best, most reliable oral tradition. But he would state it as such. Um, you know, you hear, you hear people who are honest people say every now and then uh, various things such as, um, I came across this somewhere, but I'm not for certain where I saw this. Well, that's good. A at least we know something about the origin of that. You know, I come across things all the time, and I can't remember where I saw that later on. So I have to make sure I recognize that because I don't, I'm not really in command of all the facts here. Who said that and under what circumstances was that said? 
And I'm just reading it in a secondary or tertiary author where he's quoting someone who quoted from this source. And then you go back and look in that source yourself, and you may find something different there that's, that's um, going to alter your whole interpretation of the facts. Take the case where we studied in the book of Ecclesiasticus of um, Dr. Freeman's use of a certain verse over there in favor of medical science. That probably was heard or read as an isolated passage in some other writing or heard from some other speaker. I would say it probably he came across it in some other writing. And I'm sure I've made those type of mistakes myself. I'm, I'm not being critical of him. It's just that I remember that case very vividly because it has a lot to do with what we believe and what they believe down there. And he used that verse, but as though um, this book was in this chapter is really condemning medical science and all this. And you, all you do is open your apocrypha and read the chapter, and you could um, ably entitle the chapter in praise of medical science if you really want to see the context of this which had been lifted out. And I'm sure all public speakers have done that before, but the fewer times that you do that, the better. Sooner or later, your sin is going to find you out. <laughs> You may quote some other author and never have time to study it, and if you had time, maybe you wouldn't have changed your view. Your view stays the same, because it just happens to be that the sentence taken out also fits the context very well. But there are going to be occasions where that doesn't work. And I guess what I mean, and what I'm saying all this is, so many times you see in people's writings, um, and this is just plain dishonesty, and people do not deserve to have a public audience, whether a reading audience or a congregation out there listening to them speak, if they deal with historical material like that. But you hear so many times someone say, Augustine said this. Like the Catholics say, Augustine had a larger canon. You know, he had a 44 book Old Testament canon instead of a 39 one. But, but now wait a minute. You've got a, what else did he have to say about the Old Testament? What else did he say about the, the confines of, of the canon of scripture? What else did he say about authority? He might have had a 900 book canon, but then four sentences later, did he not then say, but 39 of those 900 books are special books then? Well, I don't care how big his canon is. He told me something about those 39 books there. And that's a very deceptive and really unlawful way to use the facts of history. They just, they'll take a statement of Calvin and they'll take it totally out of context because in that one sentence, he supports their doctrine. I mean, you could hardly believe that anyone who is of the Arminian background would ever quote Calvin for their beliefs. <laughs> uh, Calvin was fighting against those remonstrants back then. But people will quote Calvin as one who didn't believe in the sovereignty of God. Because you might could find a sentence somewhere in Calvin's writings that says that Christ died for the whole world. And then we Calvinists say, well, now, wait a minute. I thought Cal Calvin believed in a limited atonement, that Christ died only for the elect. And yet you'll find another verse over there in Calvin that says that Christ died for the whole world. Well, Calvin may have said that, but what was his belief about that verse, though? Or that happens to be a verse, second, 1 John chapter 2. What did he believe about that state? That's another thing entirely. So I'm saying Venerable Bede is reliable. What Venerable Bede said about Kedman is probably true. Not only is he such an, an accurate, reliable historian, but he also lived right around the same time as Kedman himself. And historians ought to learn from someone like Bede, and I include myself. Very reliable, and um, he did his homework. Uh, Bede did biblical exegesis on many Bible books and passages. He's most famous for his work, The Ecclesiastical History of the English Nation. But he did biblical exegesis on many Bible books and passages. In a letter to Egbert, Egbert was his um, pupil, remember, in a letter to Egbert, we know he translated into Anglo-Saxon the Apostles' Creed and the so-called Lord's Prayer. We know that he did that. The Apostles' Creed, which is in its late form by this time. Fourth century onward, it's in its late form, which you probably know from the JDS book that we did, includes the, the so-called descent into Hades. It was not found in the original. Apostles' Creed. But it wasn't written by Matthew or Thaddeus anyway, though. Uh, from a letter of his disciple Cuthbert, C-U-T-H-B-E-R-T, from a letter of his disciple Cuthbert, 
Cuthbert was later abbot of Wearmouth and Jarrow, two twin Benedictine monasteries in Northumbria. He told us of the last illness of Bede's life. And this is an interesting story. I'm going to read this story to you. Cuthbert told us of the last illness of Bede's life that came upon him as he worked translating the Gospel of John into Anglo-Saxon. We know he did the Apostles' Creed. We know he did the so-called Lord's Prayer. We also know that he worked on the Gospel of John. Okay, here's some of what this letter has to tell us. Now, you have to get this picture. We're in the year 735, in the late spring, the month of May. He has contracted some type of illness. A lot of people died of pneumonia in those days. A lot of people died of pneumonia. A lot of people still die of pneumonia. But more people back then died of pneumonia, even up until recent times, than I think die today. But he had contracted some illness, and probably it was pneumonia. His illness grew worse with much bodily swelling. He's on John, working on John, remember. Uh, he's working his way through it. He's sick from the beginning to the end, but he's growing progressively worse, and he's doing um, the Gospel of John chapter by chapter, so he's getting toward the end. He had a scribe working with him. His scribe says, There remains now, all these are direct quotes here, there remains now only one chapter in other words, he was his amanuensis. Bede wasn't writing. He was dictating. This was his personal scribe copy. There remains now only one chapter, but it seems too difficult for you to speak. Bede said, it is easy. Take your pen, mend it, and write quickly. At 9 p.m. that night, May the 25th, 735, his scribe said, Master, there is but one sentence lacking. Last sentence in the Gospel of John. Um, Master, there's but one sentence lacking. He wrote quickly. He spoke quickly until the scribe said, Now it's finished. Bede said, Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. And then he died. One minute after nine, May the 25th, 735. That's probably a true story there. That the thing he was doing on his deathbed was trying to translate the Gospel of John for the people of England. And he got down to he needed one more breath. Melodramatic, but there's, there's little doubt that this is a true story here. That this man, I mean, what would you be doing the, your last day on earth, your, your last breath that you were breathing? Um, he wasn't saying goodbye to friends and signing the will and dividing the inheritance and all of this. Um, and he was thinking of others, not just himself. This, translating John is not going to do him any good. He's going to be with John in just a few moments. So translating John is not going to do a lot of good for him. It's going to help a lot of other people. Down to his last breath. I like that story. It's even better than Kedman's story, the man who stole away to sleep in the stable. Master, there's but one sentence lacking. And he spoke quickly until the scribe said, It's finished. Bede said, Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. And then he died. So that's a proper place to end this morning.